Um, so Gary Hall is Professor of Media and also the Director of the Centre for Disruptive Media at Coventry University, who uh, generously helped to fund us with this. Um, he's a critical theorist working on politics, philosophy and technology, um, and is the author of Culture in Bits, Digitise This Book and the forthcoming Pirate Philosophy. Um, today he'll be introducing the theme of post-humanities to us. Thank you. I'm going to do my best, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, yes, even though we did pay for it, but still, thank you for inviting <laughs> me and, and organising it and laying it on. Uh, it's really great, it's really great. Uh, so, uh, just to kind of pitch it, because um, I didn't want to cover what uh, Julianne was covering, so I'm going to be talking about the, the humanities part of the digital humanities, focusing a little bit on more on that. Um, so you could call it post-humanities, we can also get into things like the post-digital, but mainly the post-humanities side I'm going to be focusing on today. And um, the thing is, post-humanities doesn't necessarily exist in the way that we've seen digital humanities does. It's something we're trying to kind of create or produce or, or some people might say make up. So it's not something I can introduce in that way, so I'm going to just show you the, the thinking behind why I'm interested in this. Um, and why we're kind of working and pushing, to, and pushing towards that. And picking up on the reference in the conference description to theorists, uh, Rosie Brydotti and Bruno Latour, and the fact that, yeah, theory is one of the areas I work in. So the question I kind of want to address with you today uh, is this, is just what forms might theory take in the 21st century when we're talking about things like digital humanities? So that's what I'm going to be looking at. And I haven't worked out how to do that yet. There we go. There we are. So some people, as we've seen, some people associate with the digital humanities have suggested, uh, this is a very takes on it, we've already seen some of those, suggested we've embarked on an, actually on a post-theoretical era. So that's exemplified by a shift away from the concern with ideology and critique, and we've moved towards much more quantitative and empirical methods of analysis, such as those we've seen around big data and visualisation and all those kind of things. Others have pushed back a little bit on that uh, and they've insisted well we should be developing new forms of theory that are characterised more by an ability to combine the methodological and the theoretical and the quantitative and the qualitative uh, and the, digi and the uh, digital and the traditional humanities and Joanna Drucker who was mentioned, she'd be kind of one of those that's pushing uh, towards that. Uh, me, of course, well, I don't want to champion any of those approaches. Um, instead, what I'm arguing is that just as some people have been calling for a post-crash economics, which is a radical rethinking of economics that challenges its own foundational assumptions in the light of the most recent crisis of capitalism, so we need a post-crash critical theory too. And this is a, this is a theory that's not just going to call us on, on us to think differently, but also calls on us to change radically our scholarly practices in the sense of performatively inventing new economic, legal and political models for the creation and publication and circulation of knowledge and research. And it's this that I'm going to be suggesting that we think in terms of post-humanities. It's not like we've got humanities and we're just going to bring the digital in. It's going to, we're going to have to change what we do. So, to begin at the beginning, uh, why am I arguing for a post-crash theory? Well, it seems to me that many cultural forms haven't yet quite caught up with the change in political mood following the financial crisis of 2008. So they're still being dominated, as Rean Jones says in this book down here, says of the music industry, by careerist and commercial imperatives, hostility towards the new and the untried and the perhaps unprofitable, and the social stratification of access. So yeah, we can think of all the stuff in the papers at the moment about how the acting profession is dominated by those from public schools such as Eton and Harrow and the fact that British journalists on average today now come from a more privileged background than do bankers. And yeah, we're all used to using that. We go, yeah, phew, that's all about them. But if music and film and television haven't adjusted to this post-2008 political atmosphere, then this is also true of those cultural forms that are associated with what we do, with the production and publication and distribution of academic research. We're still acting you know, pre-2008. And this is a particular issue for theory. Theory is important 
because of its ability to denaturalise and destabilise institutional and disciplinary formations, including those that are associated with theory itself. So theory is committed to challenging and changing our ways of being and doing in the world. Yet if, as Bernard Stiegel insists in Technology and Time, if Western philosophy has forgotten its origins lie with techniques, if it's repressed techniques as an object of thought, then many theorists, including Stiegel himself, have forgotten and repressed the media technologies by which their own work is not only produced and published and distributed, but also commodified and privatised by for-profit companies operating as part of the culture industries. So they can all tell you so we're all being duped by, by, by TV and, and journalism and film, but you know we're part of that. We're, we are not outside the culture industries. Now this kind of complacency is particularly noticeable when academic research is made available via those transnational corporations that are associated with disruptive digital technologies including social and mobile media and e-books and search engines and the cloud. So we all know the names, Amazon, Apple, Google and so on. And these neoliberal technologies of the self encourage us to be highly visible entrepreneurs of ourselves and our subjectivities, to borrow Foucault's words from the book of biopolitics. So we have to take responsibility on ourselves for managing and branding and promoting and marketing our work and ideas and charismatic authorial personalities using tweets and blogs and podcasts and YouTube videos and whatever else you're going to be doing with this, no offence. <laughs> How nowhere is this kind of forgetfulness more evident than the way theory continues to be dominated by the print on paper codex book and journal article, together with many of the concepts and practices that have been inherited with, with them from the era of writing and the book, and especially the industrialisation industrialization of printing that took place from the middle of the 18th century. So the latter include the sovereign proprietorial subject, the individualised author, the proper noun or name, the finished object, fixity and originality, along with all the kind of institutions that sustain and support them, the university, the library, the public house and so forth. And it's in fact these historically inherited concepts and practices and institutions they contribute significantly to the commodification and privatisation of research by for-profit publishers through the continually shaping of conditions of possibility in the academy. So it's not just people who are on Facebook that are being commodified, we're being commodified. You know, we kind of think, oh, it's all, it's all the new media stuff, but it's happening to us, but we don't think about it so much. Okay, so, one of the main points that I want to make today is that when it comes to our ways of being and doing these two culture industry dominated systems for the publication and dissemination of research, what we might crudely categorise as the classic closed system of print culture and the newer semi closed system of social media, the knots are very different in this respect. They have differences, but they're not so very different. Let me give you some examples. If we take the way that Facebook and blogs and Twitter are contributing to a process of neoliberal subjectivation, in which we act as highly visible entrepreneurs of ourselves through the adoption of self-presentation techniques originating in the culture of Silicon Valley. Things like micro-celebrity, self-quantification, you know, how many hits have I got, you know, is mine higher than the was last week, and self-promotion, always getting ourselves out there in a variety of different media. And it's a process of self-forming, we're doing this to ourselves, we're not being kind of disciplined into it, that links to what Roger Burroughs calls the metricization of the academy. And Burroughs coins this term to describe how we're now subject to a swathe of techniques for measuring our teaching loads and journal citations and grant income and research outputs and impact. Many of them, of course, enacted automatically by code and software and algorithmic forms of power. And as he notes, drawing on the work of Rosalind Gill, such quantified control has left a large number of us exhausted and stressed and overloaded and suffering from insomnia and feeling anxious and experiencing feelings, of, experiencing feelings of shame and aggression and, and hurt and guilt and out of placeness. It's going to get better, don't worry. <laughs> now my issue is the focus and analysis, analysis of that kind is on the, the new voluntary self-governing subject that we're transitioning into. 
rather less concern tends to be given over to the configuration of academic subjectivity and the related media technologies that we're changing from so it's all you know what the internet's doing to us uh, we kind of have a blind spot about the media technologies that we just generally use and take for granted yet the latter's important because it's very often a liberal subjectivity one that as far as the creation and publication and dissemination of research is con concerned has until recently occupied a position of hegemonic dominance within the profession in, indeed if liberal, liberalism is concerned with the defence of human rights and respect for individual liberty what's really being condemned in many accounts of the becoming business of the public university is the way one form of liberalism is being intensified and transformed into another specifically neoliberal interpretation of what among those rights and values are most important so you've got the unassailable rights of property an extension of the value of the market and its metrics in all areas of life coupled with the reduction to a minimum of the role played by the state and the public sector and welfare of course yet as I said the majority of critical attention has been focused on how a, how a neoliberal self-disciplinary subject is being configured with the help of software and code and the related means of algorithmic measurement the result is that a liberal academic subjectivity is in effect positioned as almost some kind of solution or at least a preferable option to the shift toward the enterprise culture and the quantified academic of neoliberalism now obviously I'm moving really really quickly here and there's a whole history we can get into around liberalism and things like that I want to stress though that the argument I'm making is different to that the neoliberals themselves, you know, neoliberals always tend to characterise uh, those who struggle against their modernising project as reactionary and conservative. And we always have that in our own institutions. Soon as you get a fuss about it, it's like you're old fashioned, you know, times have moved on. I'm also aware that those, oppo um, those opposing neoliberal subjectivation they hold a range of different political views and positions. And liberal, liberal, liberalism itself is a philosophy of many strands and varieties however if we go back to the birth of biopolitics we find Foucault arguing there that liberalism needs to be analysed not as a theory or as an ideology but as a practice as a way of doing things and this insistence on analysing liberalism as a practice can help us to understand something important about our ways of doing things as academics and <coughs> theorists because while many of us espouse explicitly anti-liberal or even anti-neoliberal theories and philosophies whether they're inspired by Marx or Foucault or Deleuze or Haraway or Latour or Laruelle or whoever you're going to try and get in there we're liberals nonetheless by virtue of how we live and work and act in the world in other words regardless of what philosophies we profess in our practice, in the forms our work takes, in the ways we create, publish and disseminate it, we continue to act according to a liberal model of what it is to be and do as an academic. And put crudely, it's a model that forecloses an appreciation of the collective nature of identity and instead presents the work of a writer or a theorist as the original creation of an individualised, proprietorial, human subject. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the time I've got left is I'm going to use, I'm going to provide some examples, and it's taken from the Power of Philosophy book. And these deliberately feature some of the most radical thinkers I can think of, the people you think that were really questioning all this. I'm deliberately focused on them, and I've taken them from three of the most dominant trends in critical thought today. So we're going to go through, and it'll be all right, it won't, it won't hurt too much. Uh, we're going to go through Deleuze influenced post humanism, we're going to go through Italian autonomist influenced post Marxism and we're going to do Latour influenced object oriented philosophy just at the end all in 15 minutes but it'll be okay we're going to get there come on now the reason I'm referring I'm going to be referring to specific theorists here because one of the things that I've learned from theory is the importance of producing a careful rigorous singular engagement with particular thinkers and texts and for me this is kind of important so we avoid the sort of anti-intellectual moralism 
that can be identified in a number of branches of theory today. I'm kind of thinking of that repetition of uh, oversimplified position statements that encourage us or endeavour to replace one mode of thought with another. So, you know, uh, we're going to replace textualism with realism and materialism, or we're going to do representational, uh, replace representational with non representational theory, or negative critique with construction and creative affirmation. And these kind of positions have come to be accepted almost as a new orthodoxy. Yet just to take one of those examples, critique can't be contrasted with affirmation. Uh, as Judith Butler's reading of Foucault's lecture, What is Critique, makes clear, and I'm just going to draw on this quickly to, just to save time, for Foucault, as indeed for Adorno, critique is not reducible to arriving at negative judgments. It's an art. It's a practice that not only suspends judgment, but offers a new practice based on that very suspension. And this critical practice entails self-transformation. Self-transformation of the subject in relation to a rule of conduct. It's thus to risk one's very own formation as a subject. And without critique, we're just trapped in repeating what we already know and are and do. So you can see where this is going to come in further on. But with all this in mind, let's begin with the first of the theorists mentioned in the conference description. So, in her recent book, The Post-Human, Rosie Baidotti proposes a number of criteria for a new post-human ethics capable of generating the conditions for a new, renewed political and ethical agency in the Anthropocene era. And these criteria include non-profit, emphasis on the collective, experimenting with actualising potential or virtual options, remember the emphasis on practice I was talking about, and a new link between theory and practice including a central role for creativity. At the same time, Brian Dotti argues that the contemporary university needs to redefine its mission. And the key words for her here are open source, open governance, open data and open science. Now what's so exciting about Brian Dotti's work here, and in fact all the theorists I'm going to go on to mention, is the way she's clearly opening the door for a radical future mutation of many of the ideas which the humanities are based. So you've got the subject as a unitary identity, you've got the individualised sovereign, proprietary author, originality, the signature and so on. So this seems to be calling for a profound transformation in our ways of living and working and acting and thinking as academics and researchers. And I say seems, however, because Brad Otty can also seem to be keeping this door barely ajar if she's not actually slamming it shut again. The emphasis she places on affirmative post-human alternatives to dominant representations of the self, on non-profit, on collectivity, on open source and open science, is kind of undercut by the fact that Brian Dottie has not actually published her book on a non-profit basis at all. She's published it with Polity Press, who, although independent, distribute the post-human through Wiley. And Wiley are one of the big four profit-maximising publishing mega-corporations along with Reed Elsevier and Springer and Taylor and Francis in former, and if this was pantomime, you would all be going, boo. <laughs> Nor has Bride Dottie made the posthuman available to others for sharing and reuse on an open source or open access basis. And indeed, far from her methodology not being about the authority of a proper noun, a signature, as she puts it at one point, the posthuman very much functions to sustain the sense of Bride Dottie as an identifiable universe unified individualistic human, one whose subjectivity is static and stable enough for her to be able to assign her name on a contract, giving her the legal right to assert her identity <coughs> as the author of the work in accordance with the UK Copyright Act and to claim this original, fixed and final version of the text as her intellectual property. OK, well, that sounds pretty harsh. Well, what could she have done different? What would Bridal could do different here? Well, perhaps she should have published a book online on a Creative Commons basis instead. And this is what uh, Mick Merzoff, who was mentioned earlier, this is what he suggested. So writing on his Occupy 2012 blog, he teases Michael Hart and Antonio Negri for publishing their pamphlet on the global social movements of 2011 using a copyright all rights reserved licence. For a project about commoning, wouldn't a Creative Commons licence be more appropriate, Merzoff asks. 
And no doubt for many, there is something hypocritical about radical theorists advocating a politics of commons and commoning, yet appearing to let little of this politics impact on the decisions they make regarding their own work and business and practices. And all the more when a good number of them end up supporting thorough, profit-maximising commercial publishers as a result. So Amazon, for example, are included on the list of privately owned companies that aggressively avoid paying the standard rate of 21% corporation tax in the UK. My concern, however, is not to develop a moralistic critique of Bright Otty and or Hart and Negri for failing to make research available on a Creative Commons or open access basis. And that's because neither of those are necessarily anti-commercial or anti-capitalist either. In fact, what's so interesting about the question of the politics of, sh uh, question of, the politics of sharing online when it's in approached in relation to theory is rather its potential to raise the stakes even higher than Merzov's commentary on Hart and Negri even higher than that does, and he's hoping that that itself is not a cheap shot. The kind of philosophical irresponsibility I'm referring to extends even to those occasions when theorists do attempt to make their work openly available for others to copy and distribute and sell or reuse. Such is the tendency of theorists to rely on predefined and sometimes only superficially understood ideas of creative commons, open access, copy left and open source, that they often get Caught, caught up in replicating uncritically many of the established concepts and values and practices to do with the proprietorial subject, the individualised author, originality and so on, that these moment, movements themselves presuppose and take for granted. And this is especially the case with regard to the use of Creative Commons licences and the resulting repetition of really quite conventional understanding of the subject, author and originality these licenses depend on. So I'm just going to illustrate this quickly uh, by taking another radical thinker uh, who's proposed a fundamental challenge uh, that, that, that challenged the human fundamentally in the place of Western human thought and kind of links us back to the Latour of the concept of description. So in his 2009 book A Prince of Networks Grim Harman develops an earlier account of the importance of Bruno Latour for philosophy in which he presents the French sociologist as given as possibly the first object-oriented philosophy. Harman does so on the grounds that there's no privilege for a unique human subject for Latour. Instead, you and I are actants, Immanuel Kant is an actant, dogs, strawberries, tsunamis, all actants. And so with this single step, he writes, a total democracy of objects replaces the long tyranny of human beings in philosophy. Now, interestingly, Prince of Networks is published on an open access basis by Repress, using the kind of Creative Commons license that would presumably be considered, being considered by Merzov as being more suitable for Hart and Negri's declaration. Yet, even though it's available open access, that doesn't mean that a network of people, objects, or actants can take Harman's text, rewrite and improve it, and in that way produce a work derived from it that can be legally published. Since Harman's chosen to publish his book under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, which is the most restrictive CC license, any such act of rewriting would infringe his claim to copyright. This applies to the right Harman wishes to retain to be identified as the author of Prince of Networks and to have it attributed to him precisely as a unique human subject. It also applies to Harman's right of integrity which enables him, as a singular human being, to claim the original ideas it contains as his intellectual property. So we can see that for all his philosophy is concerned to displace the human subject from the centre of Western thought, Harman in fact adheres to a post-enlightenment conception of the individual human subject as citizen, as rights holder, as property holder, every bit as much as does Bridotti, Hart and Negri, or any of those modern philosophers he chastises for having followed in the footsteps of Kant. Nor would this problem have been avoided if Harman had used a less restrictive CC license such as CC BY. What Create the Commons offers is a range of copyright licenses that authors can choose from in order to grant others permissions to share their work and use it creatively. 
In this way, Creative Commons provides a means of protecting the rights of creators from the extremes of IP law. The result, however, is that Creative Commons is not advocating a common stock of non-privately owned works that everyone jointly manages, shares and, has, and is free to access and use at all. Instead, it presumes that everything created by an author is their original property. If anything, Creative Commons is concerned merely with helping the law to adopt a new conditions that are created by digital culture. Now, granted, given the lack of a legal, economic and political anti-humanist or anti-liberal alternative to publishing either on a copyright or rights reserved or open access and Creative Commons basis, there are professionally recognised there's kind of no easy way of responding to this raising of the stakes for research and theory in what we do. Nevertheless, what I'm interested in is how digital technologies can help us to creatively disrupt some of these core humanities concepts and practices and institutions, both theoretically and performatively. Okay, I've got about five minutes left. Of course, I? Okay, so, all right, I'll just take you through the melancholy bit. This is, you know, this is what we can do different. In fact, it can be argued that the failure to denaturalise and destabilise the liberal model of academic subjectivity, to give up our notions of individualism, of individual rights, of property and so on, even though we understand that you know, a lot of us are involved in questioning liberalism and that itself involves questioning the human and human rights and so on, it's that that enables us uh, and our ways of being and doing to be so readily controlled and commodified by the measuring logic of neoliberalism. So it's a failure that has left many of us in a state of melancholy, of unresolved mourning for what we've lost. Unresolved because that liberal way of doing and being as academics is not really fully acknowledged as something that we are attached to. So it's not something that we can work through. We all think of ourselves as often, many of us as radicals, we don't think, yeah, I'm just really a liberal at heart. So you're kind of not acknowledging so you can't work it through. And that in turn leads to a state of disorientation and paralysis. Precisely because it's a loss we can't fully acknowledge, we're able to, unable to move on to achieve an adequate understanding of how the increasing neoliberal takeover of the university, how it can be reinflected differently and effectively, or what we should endeavour to replace the neoliberal university with. So what I want to explore, what we're exploring around ideas around the post-humanism, post is how we can offer, operate differently with regard to our own work and roles and practices as academics and theorists, to the point where we do begin to think and think through and take on, rather than take for granted or repress or ignore, some of the implications of the challenge that is offered by theory to liberal concepts of the author and the subject and copyright and the human. And the implications of that for how we live and work and think, and especially the ways in which we create and circulate and share knowledge and research. So in short, how can we produce not just new ways of thinking about the world, which is what theory and academic, academia has traditionally sought to do, but new ways of actually being and doing in the world as theorists and researchers. And given their fundamental importance to the humanities, it's our self-transformation of these concepts and practices and institutions that I'm suggesting that we begin to think of in terms of a post-humanities. What I'm interested in here is, is us critiquing certain forms of humanism and the humanities, the point of putting our own subject formation at risk. Remember when I was talking about Foucault and what's critique? so we can explore other alternative ways of knowing and being and doing. And yeah, that's what I'm thinking of when we're thinking moving towards post-humanities. Okay, thanks very much.